battle of the sexes. In this timeless struggle for supremacy between man and woman, man had held his own until that fateful day in 1492 when Christopher Columbus discovered America. Out of this new world emerged a new woman, destined to turn man the hunter into man the hunted. Mr. James Thurber, America's great chronicler of man's losing battle, has warned us all. We are living at a time when in the moth-proof closet dwells the moth. Well, I think that's all for today, gentlemen. Erwin uh, must look smart, you know. If she does that to me once more, I'm going to kill her. We'd only send her away somewhere to do an export survey. Somewhere really wild, really remote. I, I've got it. We've never had an export survey of Scotland. Scotland? CJ, that's great. <laughs> Imagine, Scotland. <laughs> Erwin Hoffman here can go with her. <laughs> CJ, you can't do that to me. You can't do it. CJ, I'll do anything, but hey, you don't mean it, do you? <laughs> you wouldn't do a thing like that to me, CJ. We, 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 we've been pals. <laughs> <laughs> so destiny sent Mrs. Barrows to carry the sex war into one of the last bastions of man's supremacy, Scotland. A man's world. A world in which the shortest skirts are worn by man. A world in which even the can-can is danced by man. This was to be the battleground. Now every war produces its hero. The man with that little extra something that other men haven't got. The Superman. Mr. Martin may not be cast in the heroic mold, but he is a hero just the same. Even buying this packet of cigarettes is an act of heroism. Why? Mr. Martin has never smoked a cigarette in his life. The purchase of this bottle of good Scotch whiskey too is an act of valor, because Mr. Martin has been a lifelong abstainer. Strange? certainly is. But perhaps we'd better begin at the beginning, in Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh. This old family business of fine hand-woven tweed, the first faint rumbling was heard of distant battle. Oh, sorry, Mr. 
Mr. Darling. Do you mean something a little lighter in colour, madam? No, I mean a little lighter in... I mean a little lighter in weight. This is a bit heavy for California. Uh, uh, have you any wool mixed with nylon or, or synthetic fibre? Synthetic fibre? We have nothing to do with synthetic fibre here, sir. Sorry. Excuse me. Yes, darling? A message for Mr. Martin from himself. You'll find him upstairs. How is Mr. McPherson? Oh, sinking fast, Mr. Robertson. It can't be long now. Mr. Mickey. Yes, Mr. Martin. Could you try to find a quarter nib, please? Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. Hey, Mr. Martin, Andrew, darling, to see you. What is it, Andrew? It's Mr. McPherson, sir. I have to take you there at once. How is he? Getting very weak, the poor man. I have heard the call, Martin. The great weaver himself is waiting for me. Oh, there's plenty of life left in you yet, Mr. McPherson. I am dying, Martin. I shall be gone before my son comes home from America. Will we telegraph him to hurry back? Oh, he's ill himself, poor laddie. In quarantine with the mumps. He never was strong, you know, Martin. It's a pity I sent him to school in England. Too soft. Careering about Windsor in frock coats. I'm worried about him, Martin. He's not quite ready to take on the responsibilities of a big business. You'll have to help him. I'll do my best, sir. I'm sure you will. You always have. That's why I'm asking you. Give me a drink. Do you think that you should, sir? The doctor was oh, saying... Oh, that ignorant old fool. Give me a drink. And have a dram yourself with a dying man. If you'll excuse me, Mr. McPherson, you know I, I never... <laughs> I nearly had you, Martin. I thought you might have given way to sentiment, but I should have known better. Man is fallible, but Martin is not. Well, put your dram in with mine and I'll drink for the two of us. to his memory, there'll never be another like him, the old ginger ale in a day like this. 
Mr. McPherson on his deathbed respected my principles. Anyway, it's the same colour. He was a great man. Aye. Uh, and here's to the new head of the house, Mr. Robert McPherson. Mr. Robert. Oh, 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 heavens save us. What a come down, eh? Mr. Robert may never be the man his father was, but he's a McPherson for all that. It's a pity he couldn't be here today. It was a bonny funeral. He's only there and not there to see his poor father buried. Aye. Cast quite a gloom over the whole proceedings. Aren't you my chap? No, not me, mate. I'm promised to another. Oh, and for goodness sake, where's your luggage? Back at the hotel. The hotel? But this train leaves in a minute. That's what I figured. You got no time to get your luggage out. You're cooked. Where have you been? I've been brushing up on my Scottish. You've been brushing up on your Scotch? This guy Burns has got something. A man's a man for all that. Uh, excuse me. Angie, you're on your own. Do you mean you're walking out on this trip? Honey, I'm running. You wait till CJ hears about this. He knows. I cabled him. Barrows takes the high road stop, I take the low road stop. She'll be in Scotland way, way ahead of me. Great writer, that Rabbi Burns. <laughs> so long, Angie. Oh. Really, damn it all, I mean, where is my compartment? Your what? card number reserved is to because this is the last of the first class. Of course I reserved I've got to go, so the train's due to leave. Well, where am I going to sleep? There's a vacant compartment here if you want it. I reserved two, but I only need one now. Oh, I say, are you sure? Oh, what a bit of luck for me. Most frightfully kind of you. No, not at all. My name is Angela Barrows. Oh, yes, uh, my name's Robert McPherson. Well, of course, I've heard of them. Do sit down. Oh, thank you. So you're the Robert McPherson. Well, you must have quite a business. Well, it's really just no family firm. <laughs> oh, I love that British understatement. I'm very interested in all businesses. I'm the personal advisor to the president of a very big American corporation. I'm a business consultant. You mean a sort of efficiency expert? Well, it's a little more than that. We try to apply psychology to business. Apply psychology to business? My goodness, what will they think of next? Well, you're certainly efficient. I mean, first my sleeper, and now the brandy. I don't know what I should have done without you. Your staff certainly should have reserved you a compartment. You ought to give them hell. Well, that is, you ought to put somebody on that little old carpet. No, I'll do that. Perhaps when you've finished with your American, you'll come and put my house in order. Well, I should certainly like to look over your business. You would? It's a date. I look forward to that. My goodness, so shall I. Well, I'll be saying good night and thank you again. Good night, Mr. McPherson. I say, have you got anybody meeting you in Edinburgh? No. Oh, good. Then tomorrow morning, you must let me be your business efficiency expert. <laughs> well, you're very kind. <laughs> Sweet dreams. been with us for ages, you know. He used to drive me to kindergarten, didn't you, darling, eh? My, when was that built? She was built in 1925, lady. She's a beauty. Uh-huh. We took to it. The George Hotel and then the office. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, Mr. McPherson, thank you. My goodness, aren't they beautiful? Here's himself now. It's himself. It's himself. It's himself. It's himself. Mr. Robertson. Mr. Graham. Mr. Robertson. It's 
Tim Sams. Tim Sams. Well, well, howdy, folks. Welcome, Welcome home, home, Mr. McElroy. Thank you, thank you. As they say in Texas, it's sure good to be back. I've had a wonderful trip. Yes, indeed, a really wonderful trip. Most stimulating. I've had a wonderful trip. <laughs> I'll have a little talk with you all later. He seems in wonderful spirits. Ah, what's wrong with him? He's a changed man right enough. Do you know what he's brought back with him from America? A lady. A lady? Aye. Arm and arm, they were mincing up the Waverly steps like, like two turtle doves. Wait, he said to me. And he dashes off and buys all the flowers old Annie had with her and, and just throws them over this lady. The poor man. He doesn't know what he's doing in his grief. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I couldn't wish for anything better. A man in business needs a woman in the home. First a funeral, then a wedding, and uh, then who knows? It'll be himself. What like is she, Andrew? An American. Oh, well, thanks to the old Scottish settlers, there are still some good families left in America. Jeannie, must we have that cutter? Sorry, sir. It's the tray. The cuts dance about on it as if they were doing a reel. We'll try to keep them quiet. We thought the heads of departments might open the list for the wedding present. Yeah. It might encourage the others. Yeah. He didn't actually say they were getting married, but he was quite poetic about her. He, he said she was like a breath of the, of the new world. <laughs> This place is just not for real. Oh! Will that be herself? Oh, this is marvellous. It's, it's like something out of Dickens. Oh, do you think perhaps I ought to do it up a bit? I mean, I could get myself a new desk. Oh, I... no, no. It would be a shame to touch it. it. It's a museum piece. But if we are going to do it over, will you just relax and leave everything to me? A desk? No, no, you don't want a desk. No, no big executive has a desk anymore. That's... Mind, we've only Andrew Darling's word for it. They were like turtle doves. That's for me. Are you all right, Mr. Robertson? You look as if you've had a shock. Nonsense. And this is Mr. Martin. Martin's been with the firm for 35 years. That's right, isn't it, Martin? Next Michaelmas, sir. How do you do? <laughs> Next Michaelmas. How quaint. <laughs> Martin, I'm very happy to tell you that I have persuaded Mrs. Oh, Barrow. We already knew it, sir. We were already ahead of you. May I offer you both my heartiest congratulations. No. I was never married myself, but I understand it's a great institution. <laughs> well, you wouldn't think that if you'd been married to my ex-husband. <laughs> he thinks we're going to be married. Isn't that dreamy? Do pull yourself together, Martin. What do you think I said. Mr. McPherson has invited me to join the firm. Join the firm? That's right. As an industrial consultant. <laughs> well, will you look at his face? Haven't you ever seen a woman industrial consultant before? Don't you have women in your business? Well, there's uh, Jeannie MacDougall. Oh? She makes the tea and cleans the offices. Oh, quite a job. Yes. A woman's work. Mr. Martin, you must join the 20th century. <laughs> a woman's work. Yes, well, I knew you two would get on. Martin, in the morning, I want you to take Mrs. Barrow under your wing. Show her the ropes. Nobody understands the working of the departments better than Martin here. He holds all the purse strings. Oh, I see. Well, you are on the catbird seat. Baseball term means sitting pretty. Oh, I... oh Don't be such a square, Martin. Ah, so this is the accounts department. Oh, don't get up, gentlemen, please. The accounts department. 
My, my. Well, this is quite a change from any filing system that I know. Yes, well, I don't suppose you could really call it a system, but uh, we do find what we want to when it's needed. <laughs> this I have to see. Certainly, yes. Mr. Mickey, would you ask for something? Ask for something? Aye, hey, anything. Can I have a cup of tea, please? No, no, Mr. Mickey. Ask me for an account. A statement of the accounts as to the end of July last year. Hey, that should be a good one to demonstrate with. Yeah. I just get the steps. Oh, uh, Mr. MacDonald, would you mind just helping me across? You don't usually keep these over there, Mrs. Farrow, so I can do it, you know it. You'd never think this was a chair. It's not, it's a pair of steps. Hold my legs, Mr. Mickey. Uh, let me see now. Uh, ah, here it is. Uh, here. Uh, there. Ask me another, Mr. Mickey. A letter from the Scottish Weavers Association asking us to participate in their exhibition last October. Yes, that's a good one. <laughs> I'll just go and get it. Yes, uh, there were two letters. Uh, this one thanked us for our cooperation. Yes, well, this makes a nice parlour game, but we can't run a business this way, can we? Must look smart. And how you can work in this atmosphere? Don't you have air conditioners? No. Well, at least we can use nature's air conditioners. Mrs. Barrows, we never open the windows. Mrs. Barrows, look what you've done. I'll tell you what I've done. I've got you a new filing system. Oh, for Pete's sake, shut it. <laughs> Great balls of fire. Is that how you tackle the home market? I don't understand, Mrs. Barrows. You're selling to 20th century customers. Your display figures must look like 20th century people. That's psychology, Mr. Robertson. I mean, who would want to identify themselves with a couple of scarecrows like that? Now, Mrs. Barrows, this is the most important piece of furniture in the whole building. Will you take a wee snifter? No, thank you. It's too early for me. But you do keep a cosy little pub here. Uh, well, you see, Mrs. Barrows, our main export being to the Americas, uh, Mr. McLeod does have to be hospitable to the buyer. And naturally, no buyer likes to drink alone. Aye, you've said it. You change your mind. Let's put it this way, Mr. McLeod. Liquor and efficiency don't mix. Oh, yes, but they do, Mrs. Uh, <laughs> you see, uh, there's such a demand in our stuff that you'd buy us queue up for their quota. Really? In that case, they should be buying you drinks. Uh, you know, uh, Mrs. Barrows, uh, Mr. McLeod does sell every bit of tweed that we can produce for the... Uh... Your loyalty is very touching, Mr. Martin. Some chief accountants would say there's no need for an export manager. Not when the stuff sells itself. However, don't you worry your little head about that, Mr. Martin. I've got Mr. McLeod's problem solved. We'll simply step up production. Increase production by a thousand percent. Um, I'm afraid, Mrs. Barrow. You're afraid, but I'm not. But there's a limit to how much handmade tweed we can get from the weavers. That comes up to our high standard. I've heard that kind of talk before, Mr. Graham. Where's your factory? Factory? Yes, where the tweed is woven. Uh, you see, Mrs. Barrows, it, it's not exactly a factory. Oh, well, come, gentlemen, let's not mince words. I don't care what you call it over here. Where's the stuff made? That's what I want to see. It's made in the Hebrides. The what? Well, never mind. That's where we're going. Uh, in the, the Hebrides? Um, uh, well, uh, I'm off there next week to pay the weavers their advance money. Advance money? Yes, you see, they have to have their three months pay in advance. Three months in advance? Well, no wonder you don't get productivity. How do other factory workers manage? But these are not factory workers. Mr. I have news for you. From now on, they are. And they clock in just like any other factory workers. Do you have time clocks? 
No, oh, I thought as much. Well, you must order them, pronto. For each of them, Mrs. Bartlett? For every man, Jack, of them. Uh, yes, Mrs. Three months in advance. Well, it looks like I got here just in time. to move the weavers. They've been making tweed here for hundreds of years. They still make it in much the same way. Yeah, Mr. Martin, you don't surprise me. It's less primitive nowadays, you understand. How primitive can you get? Oh, just get that picture. Isn't that something? Oh, don't bother to stop on my account. I've got no time to be a tourist. Let's press on to the tweed business. Uh, this is it. What is it? Well, uh, Jock and Chrissy McNeil here are two of our best weavers. You mean that's all there is to it? Oh, no, no. We've about 700 of them scattered all over the island. Well, are they all that old? No, we've got some that... Well, I suppose there's no production that can't be rationalized. I beg your pardon? You've heard of time and motion study, of course. Though how that could be applied here, I don't quite see. We've plenty of time here, Mrs. Barrows, but there's not a great deal of motion. Oh, come now, Rip Van Winkle. Don't tell me you've never heard of mechanization. Well, I suppose it doesn't matter as long as Mr. McPherson has. Just wait till I hit him with my plan for centralizing the weaving. Well, you go... Oh, must look smart, you know. Now, you go off and do whatever it is you have to do, and then let's get the hell out of here. I say the windows. Are they real glass? Perspex. I could get a torch bulb and run it off a battery at the back. They'd light up. They'd look wonderful in a dark room. Oh, yes, I'm sure they would, Robert. But what do you think of my project? Well, it's bold, of course, isn't it? It's very bold. I'll give you that. Mind you, it's a break. It's the biggest break you've ever had in your life. And the best. I mean, it's a break with tradition. And how? You're the head of this house now, Robert. You must create tradition as your father and grandfather did. Yes, I must say, it's beautifully made. In isn't years it? to come, people will say Robert McPherson began it. Encyclopedias of the future will talk about the McPherson method for the manufacture of tweeds. Oh, I say, I mean, you don't think encyclopedias, but I shall have to talk it over with the boys, I mean. Try it out, you know. Talk it over with Martin. That's the one. Try it on the dog. Well, don't you let them talk you out of it. Remember, you're top dog. Oh, this is a big step, Robert, but we'll take it together. Robert, I wish you wouldn't think of me as a woman. What? I'm your business partner. Oh. Now, I've got a lot to do, and so have you. Encyclopedias. Excuse me, Mr. McPherson. It's your repeat of keys. It's jammed. 
Switch it off, Mr. Mickey. Hello? Come into my office straight away, will you? I'll come over right away, Mr. McPherson. There's no reason to shout. I'm not deaf. I'm very sorry, sir. Just a minute. Don't come in till I say. Come in now. Martin, over here. What do you think of it? Good effect, eh? Yes, it's... Uh... It's very nice, sir. Is it for an advertisement? You'd be surprised. This is a model of the new factory Mrs. Barrows wants me to build for the house of MacPherson. Centralize all the weaving. What do you think of that, eh? You can't mean it, Mr. MacPherson. Well, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Do I like it or don't I? Hmm? Well, it's not for me to say, sir. I mean, what would your father have said? Well, I don't know. Father said such a lot, didn't he? But we can't dwell in the past. We've got to move into the 20th century. Encyclopedias of the future may talk of the MacPherson new method of tweed manufacture. I really ought to get one or two of those miniature cars put outside the front entrance. They look absolutely marvellous. If there's anything else, sir. No, I don't think so. Think it over. Some of Mrs. Barrow's ideas need seasoning, you know. Like timber. <laughs> How do you like the way she's done up my office? Quite unusual, sir. <laughs> I'm very keen on my cork box. That's what they call them in the States. Do you know how old this is? Before Columbus discovered America. They didn't wear tweeds in those days. And there was Mrs. Barrows complaining that your father's ornaments were old-fashioned, sir. Macpherson speaking. Robert, it's me. I've been thinking about my project. Now, maybe you shouldn't mention it to those old fossils you've got working <laughs> I'm in a meeting, Mrs. Barrows. I'll call you back. Don't bother. That's all I wanted to say. They just wouldn't dig in. <laughs> Very amusing the way she puts things. Very American. <laughs> she wasn't referring to you, of course. <laughs> well, think it over, Martin. Yes, sir. Terribly sorry, Mr. McPherson, only the, the wire is not usually there. Yeah, Mrs. Barrows thought very highly of this. Yes, well, I'll tell her that I did it, sir. No, 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 I'll say it was my fault, that it was an accident. Well, perhaps we shouldn't mention it at all. Maybe she won't yes, notice. Yes, yes. Martin, hmm? that'll be all, thank you. Oh, I was just putting it in. upstairs windows. Mrs. Barrows is inclined to leave them open. I'll see to it right away. The insurance company don't share her enthusiasm for fresh air. <laughs>
stop where you are. Come on, get those hands up. Better come quietly. Just look at those figures. I mean, if we go on like this, the firm will be ruined. Salaries and wages are up 300%. Look at this. Office teas and biscuits for one month, nearly 250 pounds. Well, I mean, if you smothered the damn biscuits with caviar, it couldn't have come to that. I mean, how do you get these figures? Has your department gone quite mad? Yes, I would just like to point out, Mr. McPherson, that these are the figures that I give to Mr. Mickey, and he arrived at these totals on the new electric adding machine. Mickey, come into my office, please. This is McLeod here, sir. I want to talk to Mickey. I expect he's in his own office, sir. I am talking to his office. This is my office, sir. No, it's not. Are you sure? Positive. Oh, this is nonsense. The man's a perfect fool. He's in Mickey's office. He doesn't realize it. Never mind. I'll see if he's in with Mr. Graham. Yes, sir. Is that you, Graham? Oh, no, sir. This is Jock Monroe at the front. Well, is Mr. Graham with you? No, sir. There's only myself and Jock McDonald. Who is Jock McDonald? The new lorry driver, sir. Well, what is Jock McDonald doing in Mr. Graham's? No, no, never mind. I don't want to talk to him. It, I, I think you'll find that Mr. Graham is in the showroom, sir. Just allow me to press that button there. Graham speaking. Oh, well, there you are. I've been looking for... Well, what are you doing in the showroom? I'm not in the showroom, sir. I'm with Mr. Mickey. Mickey? Well, that's the man I'm looking for. Well, where are you? Are you in Are you in Mr. McLeod's office? No, sir. I'm in Mr. Martin's office. Well, you better stay where you are and I'll come and find you. I really don't know what's the matter with the staff today. None of them seem to know where they are. 
Yes, it's just so that the boys are finding these a little bit difficult to get used to, but once they understand the working of them, it'll be all right. Don't be such a stick in the mud, Martin. Perfectly simple. A child could use it. Ah! Genie, a faithless old witch. Where's my tea? I had a bit of a rough night last night, and I've got, I've got a tongue you could roast chestnuts on. But, Cloud, will you spare us your symptoms and take an aspirin? Where was I? I've been thinking, Mr. McLeod, it's no use your nagging me. I've only got ah. the one pair of hands and I'm not supposed to bring tea around until 11. And if you were to ask me, you'd be better off with a purge. Mrs. McDougall, will you try and show a little more respect for the heads of the departments? Oh, Mr. McPherson! That's me. Now, come along. Let's get out of here before there's any more of this... Ah! Ah! Sir, Martin, adding machines don't make mistakes. That's the whole point of adding. Good great, what's happening in here? They're having a picnic or something? We got them trying to sort out last month's figures for you, sir, to compare them. We've been at it since 10 o'clock. Yes, sir, this new filing system takes a wee bit of a getting used to, but uh, as you said yourself, Mrs. Barrow's ideas do need seasoning. Quite right. Where's the adding machine? It's over here, sir. Oh, yeah, I say it's jolly compact, isn't it? Now, how does it work? Well, uh, just add anything you like together, sir. Say, uh... Two and two. Now you press that. Oh, I say, that's jolly good, isn't it? Yes, sir, but uh, it says 22. Well, two and two do make 22 in a way, don't they? I mean, it's got a sort of logic of its own, hasn't it? You might say that, but it doesn't help with the salaries and wages total for the money. Oh, you've got a point there. Perhaps that was a bit too simple for it. Let's give it something it can really get its teeth into. Now then, give me a number. Uh, 142 pounds, 15 and nine. Divided by three pounds, seven and sixpence. There we go. Somebody's been tampering with it. Well, there's none of us in this office, sir, have anything to do with machinery. Well, you better find somebody who does and tell Mrs. Barrows. In the meantime, you can go back to your old system. Just as you say, Mr. Macbeth. Yes? At you, Robbie, old man. Just testing this infernal box. Every time I try to get Ginny, I get puffing belly and... Get that machine out of here and tell McLeod to come and see me in my office right away. You can get him by buzzing the back gate. Mr. Martin, Mr. Martin we can't, can't seem to find last month's figures anywhere. Oh, well, don't worry. No doubt they'll turn up later. The Mr. McPherson seemed a wee bit upset. Aye. Martin! Martin! Robert, don't shout your burst of blood vessel. Use the intercom. It's no damn good! Martin! Martin! Who are you calling me, sir? What is the meaning of all this? Let us untold the lock one. I see that they've arrived, sir. I didn't tell them to unpack the whole lot, sir. I thought that maybe you'd like to see just the one. But how many of these are there? There, sir. 307, sir. I took the liberty of cutting the order down. Cutting it down? Yes, you see, sir, uh, Mrs. Burroughs' instructions were for 607, one for each weaver. But I thought we'd save money and just get one for each crop. Mrs. Burroughs, I wonder if you'd mind holding that there for a moment so that Mr. McPherson can view it. That's the utility model. Oh, I suppose I should have uh, consulted you, but I'm sure you wouldn't mind. After all, it is uh, quite a saving. Mrs. Barrow, did you instruct Mr. Martin to order these infernal machines? No! Well, yes, in a way, I, I suppose I did, but I, I meant one clock, Mr. Martin, one. Really, Mr. Martin, I don't dig how you could... Mrs. Barrow, if we go on like this, the only thing we'll dig will be our own graves, really. I, I'm not a bottomless well, Martin. You must realise we haven't got all this money to throw around. What am I expected to do with all these? You shouldn't worry yourself, sir. I'm sure that something uh, can be arranged. Are you, Martin? Oh, yes, I think, yes. Oh, well, that's settled, then. Those are my instructions. I want everybody to get this perfectly clear in my mind. I mean, in your minds. Mr. Martin will see what can be arranged. I want all these clocks removed. I'm not going to pay for them even if they sue me. They, they can't sue me, can they? won't come to that. You won't let it come to that. I don't think you have any need to worry about that. I think I want an aspirin. Or do I? Yes, I'm sure I do. This is all your fault. Weave yourself something out of that. 
<laughs> You're a canny man, Mr. Martin, right enough. Hi. <laughs> All right, boys, back to the warehouse. <laughs> No use making excuses for me, Robert. I flopped. I know when to quit. I'll go back home. I guess you could say I've met my Waterloo. Waterloo, you mustn't think of going back to America. Well, I mean, it's only business. After all, we all make mistakes in business. I wish you wouldn't think of me as just a business partner. I am a woman, too. Do you want to know something? Oh, yes. No, no, no. I, I'd better not say it. No, oh, come on, come on. Out with it. Well, it's... Nothing. I just was going to say... Yes, yes. The only thing I'll miss in this dump is you. Oh, no, no, no. You mustn't think of missing me. Well, I mean, you mustn't think of going back to America. I'm not a rich woman, Robert, but if I could pay you just something against the loss, the costs... What costs? Well, well, all the money you're losing on my account, the, the, those squawk boxes, I haven't dared to tell you what they cost. Now they're all going back. Who said they were going back? Did I say so? Oh, but I didn't mean it, did I? And the adding machine? Oh, that's not going back. No, I will stop that at once. I'm very fond of the adding machine. <gasps> then you don't think I am a flop? Oh, my dear. Oh, Robert. Oh, no, don't look at me. I'll be all right. It's just, it's just that I'm so happy. No, no, now you mustn't upset yourself. No, what you need is a good rest. Look, I'll tell you what, I'll drive you home in my car. No, no, I insist. Now then. I don't care who you are or where you are. I want you to find Andrew Darling and tell him to bring my car round to the front door at once. Andrew Darling speaking, sir. Very well, then. Get him. <laughs> Robert, you're quite sure you don't mind me going on talking about this? I mean, well, I I'm not interfering, am I? My dear, it's your job to interfere. All right, Robert. Then I'm going to give it to you straight from the shoulder. Now, honestly, there is nothing wrong with my improvements. It's those old gremlins you've got working them. And if you're as smart as I think you are, you'll get rid of them. Get rid of them? Every man, Jack. You can't have them and progress. And as for those weavers, well, I mean, they could just draw their pensions and take to the caves. That's how much you need them. But who'd make the cloth? Join the 20th century, Robert. Stop making cloth for the privileged few. Make cloth for the millions. Build a factory of today to make the cloth of today. Synthetic fiber. <laughs> Are you all right, darling? Uh, yes, sir. Not you, you great oh, old... Lucy, oh. oh, it's time you got rid of him, too. And this old crate. Oh, Robert, you could have the whole industry by its ears. I've got the slogan for you, too. McPherson's fiber's what you need. Better far than handmade tweed. May I trouble you for your name, sir? McPherson, Robert McPherson. Robert. Would that be McPherson's tweeds now? Synthetic fiber. Synthetic fiber? <sighs> What do you think you're doing, eh? How about one for the road, Mr. McClack? You'd better go and put your head under a cold tap. Mr. McPherson sees you like that, you'll get fired, Mac. I have been fired. Eh? Aye. And you'd better look out for yourself. You're a gremlin, that's what she said. Who says? Mrs. Blathering Barris. And you should hear what she's going to do with the house of McPherson. Aye. Here. Hmm. What, what's a gremlin? You'd better go and see Mr. Robertson. Come oh, on. Robbie! Oh. Come on. Come on. <laughs> He's a very old gremlin. Will you please stop calling me a gremlin? Can you be sure Mr. McPherson agreed with Mistress Barros? Aye. Wasn't he agreeing with everything she said? Even to building a new factory? New factory? Does Mr. Martin know about this? No. He doesn't even know he's a gremlin. There was some talk of a factory. Aye, and there's more than just talk. The weavers are going to be evicted from their crafts. You're talking nonsense, Andrew. Why should they be? Why? I'll tell you why. 
suppose they can get their old age pensions and live in the caves. You are drunk, Andrew Dowling. <laughs> He's only just discovered it. But what could it mean? They're surely not going to stop the weaving. Stop the weaving. They're going to make cloth for the million. Her and Mr. McPherson. McPherson's fibers, what you need? Fiber? Uh, synthetic fiber. Mr. Graham. Who's drunk now? Come to the chair. It'll be all right. Mr. Graham. 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 Sit down. Oh, Mrs. Barrow should never have been allowed near this house. It was a terrible error. Oh, a terrible error. No good speaking about her as if she were just a, a, an entry in one of Martin's ledgers. I mean, uh, an entry can be rubbed out, can't it, Martin? Hmm? Oh, I, 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 yes, she could rub out an error. Regarding the matter of, the matter of... Yes, yes, well, the matter of what? Of synthetic fiber. We were thinking that uh, perhaps uh, it might be an error. You could always rub out an error. What was that, Martin? Oh, uh, nothing, sir. I was just thinking. Quite right, Martin. Mrs. Barrow says we must all put our thinking caps on. She regards herself in this organization as a sort of baffle or sounding board against which members of the staff must be free to bounce as often as they please. surprised, my friend, but the killer was not. He had studied his victim. He knew she was a drug addict. He had calculated that by the time he entered her house, she would be what our American cousins would call coped to the gills. Coped to the gills? But where does that lead us? There were no fingerprints in the house other than those of the dead woman. For an obvious reason, the killer never removed his gloves. Gloves? Fingerprints Nobody on the knife. The gloves. Those two gloves. were the prints of the unfortunate victim. Naturally. The killer would not risk the purchase of so obvious a weapon. The knife which dealt the mortal blow belonged to the woman herself. <sighs> Amazing. How can we ever hope to catch such no, a no. calculating rascal? My dear friend, can you not see for yourself? The presence of the whiskey glasses and the pipe points to the unknown intruder being none other than Elias Lindstrom. Elias Lindstrom. Oh, impossible. You said yourself that Elias Lindstrom neither smoked nor drank. Yeah. It is quite elementary, my dear. Neither friend. smoked nor drank. Lindstrom had brought a pipe into that poor woman's house and had poured himself out a drink. Mm. Perfect. 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 Excuse me. Yes. He was secure in the knowledge that he would be the last person to be suspected. Well done. Well done. Yes. Oh, uh, very well done, my friend. Very well done. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, serve your customers first. Oh, we're just having a crack. Uh, what would you like, sir? Uh, uh, some cigarettes, please. 
What kind? Any kind. Uh, the, the, those red ones, I always have those. Oh, yes. Filter tips. Uh, no, just a cigarette, please. How much is that? <laughs> you better try these then. Yes. Three and eleven, sir. Yes, three and eleven. It's, uh, cheap at half the price. But which brand of whiskey, sir? We have them all. I'd, I'd better have a flat bottle. Flat bottle. Yes, I always have a flat bottle, you see, because it goes in my pocket here. Oh. It fit in there, you uh -huh. see. Huh? Yes, uh, have to be the right size. Aye, well, will you try this one for size, sir? It's uh, quite a new brand, Kill Willie. Kill Willie? Aye. No, no, I don't like the name. Oh, but it, it's a good fit and a very good blend. No, no I don't uh, like the name. Uh, you know? I like oh, a different name with another uh, bottle. Well, now, how about this old acquaintance? Aye, that'll, aye, that'll do fine. Aye, how about it? Like, help fit me. Try it in there. Yes. How much do I owe you? Uh, Nineteen and nine, sir. Oh, well, uh, keep the change and have a drink on me. Mrs. Barrows, uh, and and how are you today? And how and how and, and how are you today, Mrs. Barrows? And how, oh, it's uh, it's Mrs. Barrows. Yes. And how are you today? Well, I'm just fine. How are you, Mr. Martin? Oh well, I can't complain. <laughs> Have you noticed the evenings are getting longer? Uh, that generally happens about this time of the year. Yes. It's a problem to know what to do with them. I usually stay at home of an evening. Well, I can't say I blame you. If there is any nightlife in this dump, I haven't found it yet. <laughs> Still, it's nice to stay at home and entertain your friends. Uh, I suppose you have a lot of people to see of an evening? Yes, sometimes, but you must excuse me. I must get on. Yes. Uh, um, do you ever spend an evening by yourself at home sometimes? Yes, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I'll be seeing you. What works out of your planet? How are you today, Mrs. Barrows? I'm fine, how are you? Oh, not bad. Fine. Will I see you later in my apartment? Well, I was thinking perhaps I'd better spend the evening at home, try and kill my wretched cold. What? That may be wise. If you change your mind, just give three rings. I won't come down to answer the door unless I know it's you. Good night, Robert. Person. I didn't realize there was anybody still here. I hear a sound and I thought they'd all gone. It's the my teeth file. I thought I'd leave it on your table for thank a moment. Martin. Everything under control? Oh, yes, thank you very much, sir. Are you feeling all right? Why do you ask that? Well, I don't know. It's probably the light, sir, but uh, it did seem to have a strange pallor. I think it's the light, though. Good night, Mr. Uh, Martin. As a matter of fact, I wasn't feeling very well. Do you think I ought to see a doctor? Oh, I wouldn't do that, sir. The poor men have got their hands full with this diphtheria epidemic. Diphtheria epidemic? Yes, sir. There's a lot of it about, you know. Well, good night. Oh, just a moment. Martin, please. What are the symptoms? Well, sir, I do understand from some people that uh, those who have it seem to complain of a dryness of the throat and uh, the emulsion of the legs. Of course, the trouble is the poor dears don't know they've got it and will insist on gadding about. And if they only knew the truth of it, they're a few hours from their grave. Well, good night to you, sir.
Robert, dear, are you feeling any better? Well, for Pete's sake, what are you doing here? I want to talk to you. I've got a message. From whom? Um, from somebody you were expecting. Uh, can we go up? There. Good evening, Mrs. Barrows. How are you? Just fine. How's yourself? Fine, thanks. Just letting Sally take me for a walk. Good night. Well, have a nice walk. Oh, this is Mr. Uh... Good night. What are you up to? I didn't want you to mention my name. Why not? What's the matter with it? Oh, no, no. I was thinking of your reputation. I mean... What would you think, inviting men into your flat? Well, nobody's invited you. However, now that you're here, what's the message? Uh, Mr. McPherson, he asked me to tell you something, but I can't quite remember what it was. Well, I'll be... Hey, is something wrong with you? Uh, yes, I've got a bit of a chill. I'll be all right presently. Oh, well, I'll get you something for that. And please, try to remember what the message was. I, I never go anywhere without a bottle. Well, what do you know? Uh, would you like to have a cigarette? Uh, no, thanks. I smoke only filter tips. Oh, that's handy. <laughs> Look, Mr. Martin, I don't quite get this. What is the message you had for me? Uh, well, uh, it was uh, Mr. McPherson. Uh, he said that uh, he was feeling poorly and uh, that, that he wouldn't be around to see you, but that he would go straight home to bed. And Mr. McPherson sent you around here to tell me that... Oh, come off it, Mr. Martin. Now, what is this? You live by yourself, don't you? Gets pretty lonely sometimes, I expect. I believe you came around here just to see me. Isn't that it? Yes. Uh, th that is just how it was. That's why you asked me the other day what I did with my evenings. Oh, well, I think that's real cute. Well, now that you're here, you might as well have a drink. Oh, no, can't have you drinking your liquor in my house. You must drink mine. You must drink mine. Why? What's so special about yours? Is it poisoned? Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, that was just a little joke. Well, make yourself comfortable. Take your hat off. I, I, I never take my hat off in the house. Uh, well, all right, you just sit there and I'll bring you a drink. whiskey down from up there. Yes. Thank you. I put it up there out of reach of the cleaners. You know what they are. I don't think they really mean to steal, but when they see it in front of them, the temptation's too great. Now, let me see. Ah, there we are. Thank you. Now, would you like to get some ice out of the fridge for me? Yes. Yes. Here, you'll need this. Those trays get stuck. Just stab that underneath the trays and they'll come loose all right. Well, what are you waiting for? Start stabbing. How are you getting on? Coming out? 
Peavy's. Ah, there's my little boy scout. Thank you. Oh, and this. That's right. That goes in here. So you're a secret drinker, eh? Well, well. Still Waters, that's your name from now on. Say when. <laughs> Don't you ever say when. No. Say, you weren't kidding when you said that about drinking. <clears throat> Still waters. Come on, still waters. No secret drinking in this house. Bring it in here. I was trying to. I'll just get my drink and follow you right in. All right. Now sit down and relax and take that coat off. You must be hot. I know. Well, I'll be right back. But if the thermometer says you're normal, I expect you are normal. Are you coming round to see me? Well, as I say, I don't like to risk it. I mean, the doctor's just been. He didn't seem to know much about it. He said he didn't think it was diphtheria, but... Diphtheria? Oh, Robert, now you are imagining things. Get into that little old car of yours and come on around. Well, I don't really like to, dear. It's been rather a shock, you know. Well, yes, of course it was a shock. I, I'm just sorry you can't come, that's all. I had a surprise for you. A visitor. A gentleman visitor. However, you just stay where you are if you're feeling groggy. I expect you've been working too hard. He's a bit late, isn't he? doing? Oh, Teddy boy, don't go falling out. Well now, come and sit down and tell me all your problems. There's a poor wee cat stranded on the ledge out here. Yes, well that's his worry, not yours. Puss, pussy puss, come on puss. pussy. Oh for heaven's sake, come along, puss. where is the silly animal? I'll get rid of it. Just uh, stranded on the ledge down there. Where? I don't see any cat. On the left. You'll need to get up onto the ledge to see it. Oh, there's nothing down there. Now hold onto your legs, don't worry. Well, where? Where's the cat? Pussy? Can you see it, Mrs. Bowden? No, I can't see any cat. Well, you will do now. Come on, here, here, come on. Back and finish your drink. Well, well, Mr. Martin, drinking, smoking, and being a lady killer, what would they think at the office if I told them? I don't think they'd believe you. You're darn right they wouldn't believe me. They'd think I was imagining things, like you seeing that cat that wasn't there. <laughs> they'd think I was out of my mind. Yes, they would think that you were out of your mind. <laughs> Little men in white coats would come for me. I'd be put away. <laughs> oh, you never fooled me for a minute, Mr. Martin. There's no such thing as a man with no vices. <laughs> oh, do take off your gloves. No, no. Well, really, you are. 
I'm going to drink a toast, Mrs. Barrows. A toast? Aye, a toast. Damnation to that fat, overfed buzzard, puffing Billy Bunter. Who? We Macpherson. Are you speaking of poor Robert? Really, Mr. Martin? I'm preparing a bomb that'll blow that fat fool sky high. Mr. Martin, you are drunk. You'd better go. If Mr. Macpherson could hear you... There are ways of shutting a man's mouth, Mrs. Barrows. Have you gone mad? No, not mad. Doped. Doped? I am a drug addict. I'm, I'm going to murder that fellow. And when I do, I'll be doped to the girls with coke. And then we'll have the house of Macpherson. You and I together. We'll have each other. You come here, you little naughty darling. My God, you're crazy! <laughs> Will I ring the right bell that time? Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you've come. He's upstairs. Yes, well. He's drunk. He's going to kill you. Who's going to kill me? Mr. Martin. Martin? No, no, no. He's drunk. Martin. Sorry, there's no time to lose. Don't worry about it. Well, he's hiding. I'll flush him out. Must have imagined it. Imagined nothing. He was normal, and then suddenly he... <gasps> and I even trusted him with a carving knife. In the bedroom. What was he doing with a carving knife? For Pete's sake, forget the knife and help me find him. <laughs> Must be. He's behind me. Mr. Um, Martin. <laughs> That's where he is. I don't understand, Angela. If he wants to kill me, what's he doing in your cupboard? Never mind what he's doing. He's there. The little rat out of mouth. Angela! What's the bed. He's under the bed. Angela, really? She's so undignified. Are you afraid? No, certainly not. Conceive yourself in absolutely nothing there. The cupboard. Now, come out, you son of a... Oh, oh, dear. Oh, but you're so helpless. If only there were a man here. Quite right, dear. Quite right. Yes, yes, I quite understand. I hope you didn't mind my ringing you, Dr. Fitch. Oh, yes, most distressing. We employers have a personal responsibility for our staff. Thank you. Thank you. This is Mr. Martin speaking. Martin, old chap. Step into my office right away, will you? Yes, Mr. Macpherson. I'll come over straight away. Well, have you fired him yet? Now, please, Angie. Martin's on his way over here. Is he? Well, have you notified the police? The police? We don't want to get involved with the police, do we? Well, then, we must send for a doctor. No, I've talked to the doctor. He's standing by. Oh, he ah. is. That'll be Martin now. Stay where you are, Martin. He mustn't see you. Come out this way. Well, I shall be listening. Don't you let that zombie fool you. Remember, he must be put away. Oh, it's you, Martin. Won't you come in? Good morning, sir. <laughs> Good morning, Martin. Won't you sit down, Martin, over here? Feeling better this morning, Mr. McPherson? Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm... Uh... I'm quite recovered. <laughs> oh, uh, you know that I never 
smoke, Mr. Oh, how stupid of me. After all these years with the firm, I ought to have remembered that. How many years is it, Martin? It's 35, sir, next Michaelmas day. And during all that time, you've never smoked a cigarette or had a drink, eh? Your late father, sir, on his deathbed offered me a dram, but I had to refuse it. So last night, if you had had a drink and taken a cigarette, that would have been for the first time? It would have been, sir, yes. Martin, last night when you went to Mrs. Barrow's apartment, it was simply to deliver my message, wasn't it? Your message, sir? But my cold. I'm afraid I don't understand you, sir. No, I didn't suppose you would. All right, Martin, you can go. Oh, no, you can't. You're going to no, no, tell please, Mr. Leave this to me. Please, Mrs. Mr. Barrows has been working rather too hard lately, and she's got it into her head that you went to her apartment last night and behaved in a rather disgraceful manner. It's quite ridiculous. Sorry, sir, if there's something I could... No, no, thank you so much, Martin. You may go. Oh, oh. you lying rat. You tell him what you did last night. He was drinking. He had his own bottle. He was drinking and smoking his own cigarette. Quite impossible, dear. All the cigarette ends had lipstick on them. There was only one glass, and that had lipstick on it, too. Let's thank you so much, Martin. Oh, for heaven's sake, ask Mr. White. Mr. White saw him. Who's Mr. White? The blind man. What? Well, I mean, he would have seen him. His dog sniffed at his trousers. I have no dog. I mean, Mr. White's dog. Don't listen to him, Robert. You mean Martin was seen by a blind dog? No. Uh, uh, listen to me, Robert. Last night, he was drinking some scotch called Old Acquaintance. He had his gloves on, and when you came in, he was making a pass at me. Making a pass at you with his gloves on? Oh, how can you be so gosh darn stupid? He's going to murder you. He's going to take over the house of McPherson. He's, he's, he's going to get close to the gills and kill you. Graham, retired here at once, help! Don't believe me. How stupid can you be? As for you, if you weren't such a drab, ordinary little man, I'd think you'd planned this all. How can you believe him? You're, you're mad! You're crazy! Crazy! You... you bagpipes! Mrs. Barrows, I beg you to control yourself. You're overwrought. I've discussed your condition with Dr. Fitch. He tells me such breakdowns are perfectly common with women who undertake the, the burden of business life. Oh. I'll give you business life. I'll I warn you, you to come close, I shall defend myself. Doctor. Well done, well done, oh, everybody. No, Will no, you see you to this? Mrs. Barrows is escorted to the Oh, you take your... Easy, Mr. Oh, put me down. I have never been treated like this before in my life. You'll regret this, Robert. Wait till I get my lawyer onto this. Help! Can somebody please help? Oh, I'm sorry this had to happen, Martin. Most distressing. Most distressing for all concerned. I'm afraid Mrs. Barrow's usefulness in this office is at an end. I hope you'll dismiss the whole thing from your mind. I will, thank you very much, sir. Answer it, will you? I don't feel at all well. Hello. This is Mr. McPherson's office speaking. Who is that, please? Oh. Would you mind remaining connected for a moment, sir? Mr. McPherson, he's the editor of the Scottish Daily Chronicle. He'd like to have a few words with you. I suppose we must carry on. Men must work while women must weep. Hello, McPherson here. Who said I was going in for synthetic fibre? Why should I? Just answer me that. Nothing but a damn silly rumour. You can take the facts from me, sir. I am in the... Uh... Where am I? The catbird seat, sir. I'm in the catbird seat. No, I don't know where it is either, but that's what I'm in. Thank you, Martin. That'll be all. Thank you, sir. It's you. Here. There is no need to use violence. 
There is many a battle been won without even striking a blow. What do you hear? Sure right. Battle of the sexes and never a ceasefire. You see, Mr. Martin hasn't reckoned with man's greatest hazard, a woman's tears. Put it another way, Mr. Martin has won a battle but has he won the war? Ah, oh, well, that's the way it goes. That's life. Happy days, Mr. Martin. But watch out. Mm -hmm.